as many of you know, first of all, thanks for coming. I'm glad to see relatively large number of you here, although I'm up head to head against Daniel Kraus, which is really a tough act. But I'm gratified that I have a number of people in the audience today. Most of you probably know me. I am John Weber, people manager here at Flixbus. Been at Flixbus since the beginning of 2015. A fun fact about me is that I had an earlier career in music and that I also used to play a long time ago competitive chess. Let's see if you can notice anything in my slides that has to do with that. Okay, we're here to talk about technical interviews. How many people here have ever taken a, t a technical interview? Practically everybody who's a developer, I would guess. I would raise my hand too. I've done quite a few because I started almost 19 years ago as a programmer. How many people here have ever uh, conducted a technical interview, been the interviewer? Pretty much most of you, okay. What's easier? Hmm. Kind of a hard question. I think the, the answer is that both sides of a technical interview are hard to do. We do technical interviews because we are trying to separate strong performers from weak performers. That's the theory. But there are some figures out there. I didn't make these up. I found these on the, on the internet which show that this is not always achieving this goal. For example, according to interviewing.io, only 25% of technical interviewees are consistent in their performance from one interview to the next. That means that somebody might do one interview at some place and they say, wow, that person's great. And they do an interview the next day and they say, oh, that person's terrible. Something's going on there. Also at interviewing.io, Strong performers mess up technical interviews 25% of the time. I think all of you are probably strong performers or you wouldn't be here today. Um, be honest, have you ever had a technical interview where you felt afterwards, God, I was really bad today? No, everybody has, I see that. Okay, and Wired says, most interviews can only explain about 14% of an employee's performance. Hmm. So these numbers give us something to think about. I guess the takeaway is we need to improve the way we do technical interviews. How can we make this easier and better for everyone? Well, here's kind of the agenda of the talk today. We want to talk about the goals of the interview. What are we trying to accomplish? We want to talk about the preparation. Preparing is important. We want to talk about the structure of the interview. An interview should have a good structure. It shouldn't be random. We want to talk about some techniques that are very helpful in interviewing, some do's and some don'ts, and other tips and tricks. And finally, we want to talk about how do we make the decision after the interview is over and we're trying to decide whether to have this candidate continue in the process or not. Why do we interview anyway? What are the goals? Well, the technical interview is one step in a process that usually starts with a CV being submitted somewhere, probably online, maybe a referral, maybe through a headhunter, and hopefully ends with hiring a talented, wonderful new team member. That's the theory. The technical interview, I believe, is the most important link in this process. It's the spot where we learn the most about candidates. It gives us a chance to dive down deep into a candidate's technical knowledge and maturity. It also gives us a chance to assess the candidate's compatibility with the FlixTech culture and values. That's just as important as the technical ability. Gives us also a first chance of estimating somebody's role level for whatever role they're being hired for. And another very important but easily forgotten aspect is it gives us a chance to leave a very strong impression of Flix Tech. This is important for future referrals and for our general reputation as an organization. So, preparation. Something that is often very hard to do. Everybody's busy, we've got a ton of stuff in our backlogs. Um, now I've got this stupid interview, two hours I'm having to give away when I could be working on this cool feature. Um, yeah, I'll just wing it and show up there and dial them in on Starleaf and then uh, somehow that'll happen. Well, if that's the way we approach the interview, it probably won't be a very good interview. 
for all people in involved. It's important, first of all, to take a good look at the candidate's CV. That doesn't really take too long. A few other preparation items, they seem trivial, but they're important, and I've seen them done wrong before. Don't be late for the interview. Uh, that makes a very bad impression in the candidate's mind of our organization if we're continually late to interviews. Sometimes it's hard if we're booked in a room and there's somebody in there uh, in a glass box or wherever and they don't end their meeting on time. If that happens, if there's a possibility of at least pinging the candidate and say, we'll be there in two minutes. Be transparent. A little tip, helps if you know the candidate's name. It's maybe easy if they have a name like, uh, yeah, Diane or something like that that everybody knows. But a lot of the names of, of our coworkers here are not so easy to pronounce for people that don't come from that same country, right, Balash? Um, <laughs> and so, sort of a tip to give a good impression right from the very start. Take two minutes, it's probably all it takes, Google the name, make sure you know what sex the name is so you're not surprised because sometimes with, uh, from different countries it's not so easy to tell. Uh, see if Google can tell you how they think it's pronounced. Maybe there's somebody else in your teams that's from the same country that can tell you how the name should be pronounced. Uh, if you can pronounce the name right off the go, it makes a very good impression. And if not, then you can say, if you're unsure, ask them, um, did I pronounce your name right? Ah, okay, good. Yeah, RTFM. Can you pronounce my name right? <laughs> I can't read it from here, so that's not even an issue. Krasimir. <laughs> um, RTFM. That's the, the, the FM here is the CV of the candidate. Take a good look at it before you start the interview. Review it, review the jobs they've done, review the skills they say they have. A lot of people say skills, list skills that they don't really have, surprise. Uh, assess their strengths and weaknesses. This can help you prepare questions that you really want to nail down during the interview. Have a plan. Sit down with your interviewing partner. I'm assuming that for most of our technical interviews, there are at least two people taking part. It's harder if you do it alone, so it's better to do it with at least two. Plan the questions you're going to ask. Make a list. Organize them. Group them. There's nothing that seems less professional than an interview where the questions are kind of randomly distributed around subject matter. Here's a question about algorithms. Here's a question about OOP. Here's a question about your deeper knowledge of the Java language. Back to OOP, and so on. Uh, Try and organize it well. Figure out who's going to ask which questions in advance. It also makes a bad impression if during the interview we're saying, oh, well, Paolo, do you want to ask this question now? Um, and no, it's, this is hard. It takes time to set up this kind of preparation. And I confess that I myself frequently violate this rule. Sometimes you don't have any choice but to go in and wing it. It's maybe a little easier if you're more experienced, but it's never good. Try and always prepare well. It's all about asking good questions. There are kind of four aspects to this, I think. Maybe more, but I'm going to talk about four. The one thing is to layer the, complexibility, the, com the complexity of the questions. This means you can start something with a warm-up question, then drill down a little bit more, and then really get into some detail. For example, if you're interviewing, say, a Java candidate, you might say, OK, well, how familiar are you with the Java Collections API? Well, okay, we know we have set and list and map. Ah, okay, map. So what are the implementations of map? Oh, we have hash table and hash map. Okay, and how would you implement a hash table? So you've really started at an easy level, given the candidates some confidence from the get-go, which makes them less nervous, then gives you a chance following a thread to really find out their deep knowledge. Avoid trivial questions. They're really easy to ask, but they don't teach you very much. How many people here know how many uh, bits does a Java int have? Yeah. Sort of a rhetorical question. But it's like, does it make you a better or a worse programmer if you don't know right off the bat how many ints are in a Java int or a short, for example? Probably not. And so try to avoid questions like that. Maybe it's OK as a really easy warm up to just see, but they don't really teach you very much about the candidate. Real-world relevance. These are the most interesting and important questions you can ask. It shows that we're not just having them solve meaningful things. How do you reverse a string? Well, yeah, I've already seen that, and uh, it's not very interesting. But maybe think of something. Maybe you're working on some difficult story right now and have to solve a tough algorithm. 
Nothing better in the world than to ask that during an interview. If you can get somebody who's a candidate for the job to solve your problem for you, that's absolutely wonderful. I can remember a time years ago, uh, we were looking for a front-end expert for one of the teams here and looking for somebody that had a lot of Angular knowledge. We didn't know all that much about Angular, and one of the things we were worried about was an eventual migration from Angular 1 to Angular 2, which we saw looming. It's still looming for most of the teams, but <laughs> that's another story. So anyway, we had this candidate, and he was really great. And so we asked him, how would you set up the migration from Angular 1 to Angular 2? And he talked and he talked, and we learned a tremendous amount from this interview. And we also realized he was a really good candidate. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to, to hire him for a variety of reasons, but that's a, a great way to approach the questions. Fourth thing, you can actually teach during an interview. This perhaps shows up more often in the scenario when you're interviewing a more junior person for a role. Uh, you're not going to likely be able to teach a true senior very much. Uh, but this shows the candidate, maybe they're, they just had sort of a blackout and they can't get farther with a question. So don't just say, oh, you don't know that. Let's move on to the next one. Try and help them to find the answer. I was once in an interview years ago where uh, a colleague of mine asked what has become my favorite SQL question about doing an inner join on, this, on the same table and asked this fairly young, inexperienced candidate how to implement that. It's not that hard, but if you're not that good at SQL or experienced, it's a little tricky. The candidate didn't know at all. He had no idea. He was just standing in front of the whiteboard and, hmm, what do I do? So my colleague helped him into this, explained, well, how about if you do this and that, and walked him through the whole problem until he was actually able to arrive at some semblance of a, of a solution for the problem. We didn't hire the guy, but he left with a really good feeling about the company I was working for and a good feeling about us. This world is very small, and creating good feelings about the company you work for and for your, about yourself is always a good thing. An interview should have some kind of a structure. Like I said, you don't want to ask a lot of random questions and everything. The structure will help you navigate the interview. You can keep an eye on the clock and know where you are in the interview and will also make the candidate feel more at ease. And I haven't emphasized this enough. We want to make the candidates feel at ease. A candidate in a technical interview will usually be nervous to some degree, right? And if a candidate is nervous, they are not going to give the best impression of what they can do. If you're working in a team and you know your team members and everything, you're not usually nervous when you show up at work, I hope. And that's what we want to examine. How are they in that kind of environment? There's absolutely no bonus for making a candidate nervous. So we start the interview. This is really pretty easy and straightforward. You introduce yourselves briefly, maybe a fun fact about yourself, like I did at the start. Then you can have the candidate introduce themselves briefly, talk about their job history. It's kind of interesting to see here when they talk about their job history, how is their memory? Do they remember things that they implemented three, four, five years ago? In my experience and in my opinion, this is a good quality to have. I think that most strong developers have a pretty good memory of things that they did a number of years ago and why they did it. Are they also convincing about what they did? Then you can move on to describing the product that your team is working on. This is important because you're presumably trying to hire somebody for your team. If this interview is not for your specific team but for one team in your technology area, or something like that, then you might give more general information. But our technology stacks within languages tend to be pretty similar. So tell them what technology stacks we're using, tell them how we are living agile and agile values within the teams, all these sort of things. Be enthusiastic about Flix Tech. If you make it sound like you hate your job, I don't think any of you do, but if you're sort of bored about it, then that's going to give a bad impression to the candidate. We always want to remember to sell to the candidates. Be careful, though, with the questions. It's really easy to get sort of friendly with a candidate and ask things like, oh, you're married, you have kids. Please don't do this. This could put us in violation of EU privacy laws and discrimination laws. Uh, do not ask any personal details. It's okay to ask about hobbies, perhaps, but anything, marital status, children, anything like that is a no-go in interviews. If a candidate volunteers the information, then that's okay. But do not ask that, please. Then we kind of arrive in the middle stage of the meat of the interview. 
where we start asking really technical questions. So we might want to start with some kind of easier warm-up questions and then move into more detailed questions. It's good to ask detailed questions about their earlier jobs. Like, yeah, when you built that retail web application, how did you handle performance issues with that? What did you do about the persistence layer? See what they really know about it. If they say, oh, well, we use Hibernate. Oh, okay, um, anything else? <clears throat> then also, always let the candidate know what's coming up in the interview. Instead of just shooting out the questions and bam, now here's an OOP question, say, after this, we are now going to move to some questions about object-oriented programming and to test your knowledge of that. This way they have sort of a roadmap and they know what to expect and can sort of gauge themselves. If a candidate turns out to be weak once you've really started the technical spot, it's reasonable and okay to shorten the interview somewhat. But don't exaggerate it. You know, don't try and get out of the interview after 20 minutes. That just is a little bit rude. I think it's reasonable after maybe 30, 35 minutes, especially if you're with a partner and you have some way of communicating that the candidate can't see, to say, okay, let's cut to the chase, and then to gently segue to, well, we've asked all of the questions we have planned. Do you have any questions to ask us? That way you can save your valuable time with a candidate who clearly won't be coming further, but still give us a good impression of us. On the other hand, if the candidate is very strong, then it's time to switch into cell mode. Don't keep asking hard questions, and in that case, you might want to ask ever harder to see where the limit is. But at the same time, sell your team, sell the organization to them to make them want to join us just as much as we want to have them. When we get to the end of the interview, it's important to leave the candidate time to ask some questions. It's also an important gauge of the candidate's quality to see what kind of questions they ask. Uh, if they, it's okay and acceptable if they, for example, said, well, you've explained everything about the teams and the technology so well, you answered all my questions. That's okay. If they come up with things like, well, yeah, how many days of vacation do you get? Uh, or what's the salary gonna be? Sort of shows the candidate might not be motivated by the right stuff for our culture. Avoid giving any commitments or rejections. Leave that up to HR. That's their job. They're used to handling that uh, and do it very gracefully. No matter how you already feel the interview is going to turn out, just say, thank you very much for your time today. You will be hearing from HR within the next week or so. That's a reasonable way of ending it. Techniques for the interview. Keep a friendly tone. I think this is one of the most important things. Don't play a school teacher. Don't play good cop, bad cop. It just makes, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, this leaves a nasty impression. It makes the candidates nervous. It doesn't help anything. Do take notes during the interview. This makes it easier, first of all, if the candidate continues to leave documentation for the colleagues in the next round so they know where to drill down with the candidate. And also helps HR if they're rejecting a candidate or what else they can say. Speak clearly and avoid jargon, especially Flixbus jargon. Most candidates don't know about line variations or trip bundles or such things, even if we do intimately. Also very important, don't be swayed by early reactions to, your, to the candidate in your interview. Sometimes you have a candidate and after five, 10 minutes, you think, wow, she's really brilliant. I really like this person. Don't let that run away with your emotions. Uh, stay cool, keep asking hard questions, validate your impression. And the reverse can be true. Maybe somebody comes off as being arrogant or something like that at the beginning of the interview. Appearing to be arrogant can often be caused by nervousness. So don't say, oh, I don't like this guy. Wait, give them a chance. Give feedback to their answers, especially if they give good answers. I don't mean detailed feedback, but I mean saying they've just answered a tough question about why ORM is a good and a bad thing. Uh, say, yes, thank you, good. Let them know how they're, how they're standing in the interview. Do not let the candidates evade answers or even take control of interviews. I bet most of you who've done a lot of interviews have seen candidates where they just run away with the interview. You ask a question, they talk for 10 minutes and go off to something totally different. Try and interrupt them, stop them from doing that. If it happens repeatedly, that's a good reason for trying to end the interview early. If the candidate is lacking depth in the answers, then drill down. As I demonstrated earlier with a question about Java collections, that's a, a sort of technique to try and see if the candidate has depth at all. Try and paint a picture of where we want to go into the mine and see if they can descend the steps. 
understand the concept of open questions and closed questions. A closed question is really easy. It's like, have you ever worked with Symphony Framework? Hard to answer that much more than yes or no. If you ask somebody, well, I, that open question is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of ORM frameworks, for example? If you ask somebody, have you ever used Hibernate, and they go into a discussion of the, the merits of ORM from that question, that's not a good sign about the candidate. They're not very focused. Observe their body language. Are they Googling? That's been known to happen. This is also helpful with two people. If the person that's not actively asking keeps an eye on the candidate to watch the eyes. Are they going to another screen? Are they typing? This actually happened with a working student interview a couple of years ago. Uh, she was, had a very good CV. We asked a question about something. The Skype connection broke. Uh -huh. That happened a lot in those days. We redialed. She knew the answer to the question. Okay, good. Second question. Skype connection went down. <laughs> Dialed back. She knew the answer. Wow. So we started watching more closely, and I realized, okay, her eyes were moving off to the side every time. Uh, and we, so we kind of guessed, but we played along with it for a while. And I think after about the sixth question, uh, and if I remember correctly, this was with you, Dimitri, this interview. And Dimitri asked a really nasty question, uh, a really hard one. The Skype connection broke. She never came back. She did not respond. <laughs> yeah. So be aware of these sort of things. Okay, after the interview with the candidate is finished, you've thanked them and everything, then we have to figure out how to proceed. So a good way to start is for each person to independently summarize the strengths and weaknesses of the candidate. After you've done that, assess also the soft skills, and then maybe move to thumb voting. Uh, with thumb voting, it should be pretty obvious. I think that is real clear. Any combination of a thumb down is, is a no, we don't want this candidate. Sideways, two, two people sideways is also really not very encouraging. We want to have really excellent people, and that usually shows there's a lot of doubt. And experience shows if there's a lot of doubt, it's not worth continuing. The only tough situation is like this. If one person is really for, and one person is sort of so-so, then maybe each person has to really summarize the reasons. In any case, when it moves on to the next round, then document the reasons for the decision so that the people in the next round know what's coming up. So I think I'm running slowly out of time here. Well, I had one more anecdote, actually, which was going to fit into this, and I think I do have time for that. Uh, listen to your gut feeling with candidates at times, especially about soft skills. We had one candidate who uh, had done a technical interview, came for an on-site, and then I did a people manager or whatever I was at that time interview with this candidate. And I knew that the teams really liked the, the candidate. When I asked the candidate a question, every time they answered, well, if you really want to know the truth, then... And it was like, not just one time or two times, but every question I asked. And I felt like saying, damn it, I really do want to know the truth. <laughs> I didn't say that, of course, but that's what I thought. And so I had, yeah, the guy was plainly not, uh, he was intelligent and everything, and had, was easygoing. But I thought, this is really strange. The team was really convinced they wanted to have him, so we made an offer to the person, which he accepted. And then three days later, rejected our offer again, without an explanation, disappeared. And so at the end of it, I mean, fortunately, this, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, this happened late in the process. If it had started with my interview, perhaps I would have noticed this from the start and said, hmm, this is something kind of strange here, and we could have saved a lot of time. But even so, if I had said that after my interview, instead of... Uh, just going with the opinion before and really listening to my gut, I might have said, hmm, there's something strange about this guy. Let's not do it. So do listen to your gut feelings about candidates. It's important that candidates, that our team members here are not only excellent technologists, but also people that can work really well with the teams that we work with. If it, teams are not good if everybody is not on the same wavelength, that people are disagreeing and fighting for above all. We always have conflicts, but try to get the candidates with the right soft skills, with the right values to fit in well with us. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention today. And I would now be open for any questions. Yes, Paolo. Thank you.